G'day friends, it's Andrew Goodall here from Nature's Image Photography and today I'm looking at sharpness, a few reasons why your photos might not be sharp and what you can do about it. Before we get started I would love it if you could hit that subscribe button to keep in touch with more videos from my entire world of photography. So now and then I hear from someone who just got a new camera or a new lens and they're disappointed that they're not getting sharper photos. The first thought is often to blame the new gear. And don't get me wrong, it is possible to get a faulty lens that won't take sharp photos no matter what, but that's rare, and it's far more likely that the gear is fine and the real problem is how you're using it. So in this video I'm going to show you some simple reasons your photos might not be sharp and what you can do to fix it. I would encourage you to watch every part of the video because there are several factors that affect sharpness and you really have to have them all working in your favour. Before I get to my main points, I can't do this properly without mentioning depth of field. If you take a photo with a very strong depth of field, your entire shot might be sharp. But if you have a shallow depth of field, then parts of the photo will be sharp and other parts are going to be soft. I've already made a full video explaining depth of field, so check that out if this is new to you. But just quickly, here are the three things that affect depth of field. The first is the size of the lens. The larger the lens you use, the shallower the depth of field becomes. The second is distance from the subject. The closer you get to the subject, the shallower the depth of field becomes. And the third is aperture. The wider the aperture, the smaller the depth of field becomes. Put these three things together and you can see that if you get close to your subject using a telephoto lens and shoot with a wide aperture, you can expect to have a shallow depth of field. That means parts of your photo will be in focus and other parts won't. Now this video isn't just about depth of field, but it is going to be part of the conversation, so I had to get that out of the way. Now with that in mind, let's get on with the matter at hand, the issue of sharpness. And I have four main talking points to consider. Number one, the photo is sharp, just not in the right places. Often people show me a photograph that they feel isn't sharp, and I can very quickly show them that it is perfectly sharp in places, just not the places where they wanted it to be. This is usually to do with autofocus and it can often be fixed by changing the way your autofocus is set up. By default, most cameras have the autofocus area mode set to auto, or what I often call multi-point. That means all the focus points are enabled and the camera decides what to focus on. Usually it will focus on whatever takes up lots of space closer to the camera. So if you're trying to focus on a bird through the branches of a tree, the camera will most likely focus on the branches, not the bird. If you switch your camera from multi-point focus to single point, you can make sure the camera focuses exactly where you want it to. When there's only one focus point enabled, wherever you aim that point, that's what the camera will focus on. You can see this in action here on my Lumix G9. With all the focus points enabled, I have no control over what the camera focuses on. Obviously I want it to focus on the bird, or in this case the purple fluffy dragon. But I can't stop it from focusing on the leaves in front. Looking at the photo, at first glance most people would say it wasn't sharp, but it is sharp, just not in the right places. When I switch to the single point focus and make sure the focus point is on the eye of the subject where it should be, the focus isn't just sharp, it's sharp where I want it to be. Now I have a few more examples of the difference between multi-point focus failures and single point focus successes. I'm showing you some obviously bad examples so you can really see the difference even if you're watching this on a small screen. But remember, with a telephoto lens, the focus only has to be out by a fraction to cause an unsharp result. Now, if you want to change the single point focus on your camera, well, they all do things a bit differently. But look for the autofocus area mode function and go from there. Number two, the focus is sharp, but the depth of field is too shallow. Remember one of my points about depth of field. The closer you get to the subject, the shallower the depth of field becomes. So this is a common problem with close-ups, and with macro in particular. When you're taking photos of your subject from just centimetres away, the depth of field can be measured in millimetres or fractions of a millimetre. So you can get a tiny part of a picture in perfect sharp focus, but still fill the photo with soft because the rest is out of focus. So here, fixing the sharpness problem might not be about focus, it might be about increasing the depth of field. There are a couple of ways to do this. I guess the option we think of first is to make the aperture smaller, or in other words, set a larger f-stop number. Our theory tells us that a smaller aperture creates a larger depth of field. Of course, making the aperture smaller reduces the light, so you'll have to increase the ISO or slow down the shutter speed. 
Unfortunately, a higher ISO can reduce your image quality, and if you have to slow down the shutter speed too much, you could end up with a blurry photo. Luckily, reducing the aperture is not your only option. Another easy solution is simply to move back a little and take your photo from a bit further away. If getting too close to the subject makes the depth of field too small, then getting further back is going to make the depth of field bigger. This is an original photo taken as you see it from very close up to the flower, and you can see that most of it is very soft. Now the same flower taken from further away. It takes up less of the photo, but it's sharper thanks to the increased depth of field. So when this photo is cropped, I actually have a sharper flower than the shot taken at close range. Whenever you take this approach, you can expect to do a fair bit of cropping. So you need to ask yourself, would you rather have a sharper photo that needs cropping, or a softer photo that doesn't? The choice is yours. I can suggest a third way to increase depth of field for close-ups, and that's flash. For a lot of macro photographers, flash is a major component of their work. If you flood the subject with a huge amount of extra light, you can reduce the aperture by quite a few stops without having to change the ISO. That means more depth of field without sacrificing image quality, and the extra contrast you can get from such bright light can add even more clarity to an image. So flash can be a great way to increase sharpness on close-up subjects, but flash also means taking on a whole new learning curve, and I'm not even going to try to tackle that in this video. Number 3. The focus is fine, but the shutter speed's too slow. Sharpness isn't just about focus and depth of field. Motion blur can also result in a less than sharp photo, and that can be caused either by a moving subject, like this bird shot, or a moving camera, like this slow shutter speed photo of Christmas lights. Now, I'm deliberately showing you some bad examples, once again to be sure that you can see what I'm getting at, even if you're viewing this on a small screen. But here's a more realistic example. This early morning hyena photo is just a little soft around the edges, and I'm pretty sure it's a combination of a moving subject and a slightly shaky camera. So you need to get your camera technique right if you want to be sure your photos are as sharp as they should be. First up, if you're using a very slow shutter speed, you need to use a tripod in order to eliminate any chance of camera shake. It's also a good idea to turn your image stabiliser off, because some systems can actually cause a bit of blurring if the stabiliser is working while the camera is perfectly still. If you are shooting handheld, then it's a good idea to have the stabiliser on, and you need to make sure the shutter speed is fast enough to eliminate any camera shake. For wider angle lenses, you may not need super fast shutter speeds, but you should avoid shooting handheld at anything slower than a 60th of a second, or perhaps at the bare minimum a 30th of a second. But as the lens gets larger, the consequences of a shaky camera get worse, so the shutter speed needs to be faster. A popular rule of thumb is to keep the shutter speed faster than the focal length. So for a 100mm lens, the speed should be faster than a hundredth of a second. For a 200mm lens, it should be faster than a two hundredth of a second. 300mm, three hundredth of a second, and so on. These few shots are all nice and sharp, and you can see that although they were all taken with a 400mm lens, the shutter speed was faster than a four hundredth of a second in every case. Rules are made to be broken, and like most photographers, I'm guilty of taking the odd photo at a slower speed than I probably should, trusting in a steady hand and a good image stabiliser. And often I get away with it. But when I do end up with a soft shot like this one, well, I've really only got myself to blame. Now, so far, all we've talked about is your shutter speed being fast enough to eliminate camera shake. But when you're dealing with a moving subject, your shutter speed usually needs to be even faster. For most action shots, I don't feel comfortable shooting at anything less than a thousandth of a second, and that's a bare minimum. I prefer to go faster. For this Osprey, a thousandth of a second was fast enough. For this one, which was flapping its wings, even at a 1250th of a second, you can see the wingtips are still a bit blurry. And the faster the action, the faster the shutter speed needs to be. In nature, it seems the smaller you get, the quicker your movement becomes. I don't think I've ever quite managed to freeze the wings of a bee. Number four, the subject was in focus, but then it moved before you pressed the button. This is a common issue with bird photographers. You focus on a bird sitting on a branch, waiting for the moment it takes off. But in that moment, it moves just a little closer to the camera, and suddenly it's not in focus anymore. Remember that a telephoto lens creates a relatively shallow depth of field, and that means the area in front and behind the point you focus on won't be so sharp. So if you focus on a kangaroo 20 metres away, but when you shoot, the kangaroo is only 19 metres away, 
Well, it was in focus when you focused, but not when you took the photo. I'm not going to pretend there's an easy fix to this one. You can improve your chances by switching from autofocus single or one-shot focus to autofocus continuous, which Canon calls AI servo. But even that is a bit hit and miss. The truth is, this is the reason why photographers take thousands of photos. Because for every 20 or 30 near misses, you will occasionally nail that good sharp shot. Of course it helps if your subject does you a favour and takes off on a parallel course instead of moving closer or further away. Now those are the main points I wanted to talk about, but I'm not quite done yet. There's another issue about sharpness that some people think is a really big deal and they might be wondering why I didn't put it right at the top of my list. I don't know if it even has a name, so I'm going to call it the F8 thing. When you read technical reviews of lenses, you usually find that after all the extensive testing, the lens proves to be sharpest at f8. This outcome is so consistent that it seems to be generally accepted that lenses produce the sharpest images not with the aperture wide open, but closed down a few stops, usually to about f8. Consequently, a lot of people try to shoot at f8 whenever they can. But for beginners who are still learning how all the settings fit together, the f8 thing can be a bit of a trap. The trouble with the f8 thing is that when you make your aperture smaller, you reduce the light. To get it back, you have two options. You can increase the ISO, but that can lead to a loss of image quality. Or you can slow down the shutter speed, but as we've already discussed, if you're shooting handheld or shooting moving subjects, a slower shutter can lead to blurry images. Here's a quick hypothetical. You can shoot a correctly exposed image at f2.8 and a 500th of a second. Now if you close the aperture to f8, your shutter speed would have to slow down to a 60th of a second, way too slow for a moving subject or even for most handheld photos. And of course it matters not that your lens is sharper at f8 if your photos are going to be blurry anyway because the shutter speed's too slow. So the f8 thing is good in theory and I actually use it from time to time, like with this pelican shot, but a white bird in bright sunlight is an easy shot to take without having to sacrifice anything in terms of ISO or shutter speed. If you're shooting in bright light, using a tripod, or perhaps shooting in a studio where you can control the conditions, you might find the F8 thing very useful. But in the real world, shooting all sorts of subjects outdoors, handheld, and in all sorts of light, it can be impractical and verging on irrelevant. So if you haven't heard of the F8 thing before, you might like to put it to the test. But never forget that it's only one small part of the sharpness story. For an alternate approach to choosing camera settings that's quite different to the F8 thing, you might like to check out one of my earlier videos on what I call my universal starting point. Okay, I might have more to say on the subject of sharpness in future videos, but that's it for now. I hope you enjoyed it, and for the beginners especially, I really hope you learned something. If you're struggling with sharpness in your photography, never forget the importance of good camera technique and practice, practice, practice. We all get there eventually. I'm Andrew Goodall, this is Nature's Image Photography. Thanks for watching.